A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to be. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry thirsty I'm sick. I pray that you heal them. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd, you'd be, be with those of us that are here. I pray that you help us to receive the preaching tonight. Help Brother Jeff to preach your word, Father. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Go ahead, brother. All right. Same announcements we have this morning. Let's uh, flip over to uh, hymn number 208. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? <clears throat> Are you washed in the blood? In the soul, 
This is, uh, uh, if you'll open your handout up, you'll see that what you got here is you've got a, uh, um, a list of all the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. And uh, the scriptures that go along with them. And uh, that has uh, everything to do with our sermon tonight. Um, Galatians 5.19 um, It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which means they're shown to people, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, uh, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, sedition, of strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, um, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like, of which I tell you before, and I've also have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit, uh, spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, uh, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Uh, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Heavenly Father, help us. Uh, and I pray you just uh, help us to work the right way in the work which we do. And I pray you just uh, help us to uh, seek after the spiritual things instead of the fleshy things. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we... Since we, the day we were born, we have a choice on how to live. Even more so since we became Christians. Um, choices. Well, um, every day has choices. Whether you want uh, you know, a Sprite or a Coke or, or uh, you want uh, French fries or onion rings at the restaurant or whether you, uh, you know, uh, want uh, uh, two helpings of... Uh, uh, hamburger helper or one ha uh, you know scoop or or you know just all kinds of things whether, whether you want to uh, start this book or, 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 or read this other book over here or uh, you want to uh, stop and get gas for you to work or after you go to there's all kinds of choices uh, but but the choices I'm talking about are, are life-defining uh, choices that will affect the way you live and how you live and what you get in heaven when you get there um, people have called them the, the pathways of life. And you choose. Pathways come to a fork in the road and you have to choose. 
Um, this verse also talks about fruits. Well, fruits are the product of what we do. Um, when you have a tree or a bush or something, um, it's, it's obvious that you get tomatoes off a tomato bush and you get apples off an apple tree. If you went out to the apple tree and uh, you found tomatoes there, you go like, what in the world's going on here? Um, so, you know, fruits. So if you sow to the spirit, that's what you're going to get, spiritual things. If you sow to the flesh, well, that's what you're going to get, is fleshy things. And also it has to do with destinations. Where you end up, where you're headed to, how you start off. Look, uh, let's say you're in Alabama, over there in Mobile. Um, you can't head on the highway going toward Indiana from Mobile, Alabama, and end up in Florida. You can't do that. It doesn't work. They're in opposite directions. So let, let's look tonight on which is the way that you work, okay? And there's only two points to the sermon. Of course, the first one's got all these little sub points under there. All these things. And we're going to go over each one of these. Let's look at the works of the flesh. In verse 19 and 21. And notice that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, everything on this list is sinful. And uh, we should try to stay away from these things. If at all possible in our lives. You say do Christians get involved in this stuff, oh, absolutely, um, all the time. You say, well, what happens? Well, um, they they waste. Well, first of all, they waste their time when they do it. Uh, they may lose their reward, some of their rewards when they do this stuff. Uh, they definitely have bad testimony when they do this stuff. So my recommendation, if at all possible, let us stay away from this stuff. And I'm preaching me just as much as you. Every Christian has to work on this stuff. This isn't just for the congregation. This is for everybody. Uh, let's look at all these things. The first thing is adultery. Adultery. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 27 and 28. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman... The lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So Jesus, um, he puts a, a New Testament definition to adultery. Adultery is a, a physical act uh, between people that aren't supposed to have uh, physical acts between them. Um, somebody messing around with somebody else's spouse or somebody that's not married uh, messing around with somebody else's spouse. Um, there's all kinds of things, but it's something that we shouldn't do. And Jesus said it's not only the physical act of it, but uh, men can be guilty of it. I suppose women could too, I suppose, looking at men. Nowadays, we got all kinds of things going on. Uh, just the looking of it and thinking about it, uh, God kind of uh, accounts to, of people that have already done it. So, uh, that ought to teach us something. Sometimes uh, we may not actually go out and do something sinful, but if we sit around and think about it and dream about it all the time, uh, you know, God may just account that we've already done that thing. So uh, we got to be careful of that stuff. And of course, it doesn't do anybody, this doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, the guy who's married and sinning against his spouse, it doesn't do the spouse any good, it doesn't do the person any good, it doesn't do the other person or his family any good. All it does is make a mess of things. Uh, now, the second one is uh, like unto it, fornication. And that's any other kind of uh, sexual sin that you can name. Um, just, just pick one. Uh, there's more of those around today. Um, I think they've invented a few in the last few years. I really do. I mean, uh, it didn't seem like there was that many things to, to get involved in when I was a kid. And I, as I got older, they seemed to have invented a few of them. Um, you don't want to get involved. In, look, God made marriage for a reason. And uh, not only to populate the planet, but uh, men and women are, are supposed to have a special relationship with one another. 
And if you want to have that kind of relationship, get married. There's nothing wrong with it. People have been doing it for thousands of years. Jude, verse number 7. For as Sodom and Gomorrah, oh, that's not a very good bunch, is it? And the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering vengeance of eternal fire. Look, uh, when God says some place was so bad that he gave them over to an example of what not to do, that's pretty bad stuff. Um, and yet, there are some places in the Old Testament where God told his own people that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to come out better on the day of judgment than the, some of the Jewish people. He said, how could that be? Because uh, people that you start off with God can get off track. You say, how far can they get off track? Pretty far. Pretty far. Pretty far. Uh, but it's a work of the flesh. And then we have something. We have two somethings, actually. They go together. Notice the next two on the list. Uncleanness and lasciviousness. Well, say, what's the definition of those two? <laughs> well, uncleanness... I don't know. It, it can be a, a whole lot of things. Um, I mean, you get people that are involved in all kinds of um, weird, unnatural things. Uh, and, and people that, uh, you know, have weird habits. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of people. We even have some in this town. Um, they want to, uh, you know, study the occult and different things like that. Well, nothing about any of that stuff is clean. It, it's, uh, and I'm not saying they go out and get mud all over them. That's a form of uncleanness. But, but they get all that stuff on their soul. Look, you ought to be careful what you read. You ought to be careful what you look at. You ought to be careful uh, who you hang around. Uh, uncleanness can, it's, you know, it's like a disease. It can kind of hang on you. Lasciviousness is, is like their too. Lasciviousness has to do strictly with the flesh. It's, um, kind of uh, desires, but it's desires either that have gone too far or else desires that you shouldn't have. Um... There's all kinds of weird things uh, on the internet. Um, I worry about some people. Uh, I've, I've been looking at... Uh, I, I got studying about wolves in the Bible. So I went on YouTube and I found all these videos about wolves on YouTube. People that had wolves. Uh, there's a lady on there. And they kind of pan around her farm... She's got all these pens. This lady must have 25 different foxes and wolves and all kinds of things. I don't know why someone would want all that. Can you imagine having to feed all them critters? What would you feed them? Go catch the rabbits and throw them over the, the pen? Or do they, do they have Perina fox chow? Or, you know, wolf chow? I don't know what they have, you know. Uh, but you think, okay, uh, you know, I, I can understand... Uh, somebody taking in one animal, maybe two, uh, but but people get obsessed with things. Um, there's people that get obsessed with, uh, oh, well, let, let's take one that I was involved in when I was a little kid. Uh, putting together little plastic models, okay? I used to do that. Now, I think it's good for children to do that sort of thing. For one, it teaches them... Uh, to be careful, I mean, you can't rip that stuff off the little plastic skeletons that comes with. You have to be careful not to break anything. And then, you know, you have to paint all the stuff. And then you have to be careful and glue it together. It teaches kids motor skills and crafts on how to put things together and make things look nice. I think it's a pretty good thing. But then, then you have people that kind of, they went from childhood and they kept on with the model thing. And now they're like... 53 years old and their house is full of little models. I think that's a little weird, to tell you the truth. Now, 
if you grew up and you decided, okay, I'm going to make my own models, now, you know, I can understand that. That, But then you get into saws and, you know, may, I, I saw this one guy on YouTube and he actually, he makes metal models and he actually pours his own metal parts. He makes the molds and, so, you know, that's kind of neat. You know, uh, I, in the long run, what does it do? But... You know, the guy has a, a he, he has a hobby. Uh, I assume he has a regular job, or maybe he sells the models and he makes his money that way. Uh, you know, I'm not saying you can't go in that as a business, but I, what I'm saying is, if you keep on with childish things into your adulthood, it's it's kind of weird. You know, uh, if you go around and uh, you know you. You dress up like a baby and you lick lollipops and you know you're 50 years old. There's something weird and wrong with you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, and all that stuff is has to do with the flesh. It's what the flesh wants. It's what the flesh wants to do. Look, let me tell you this. You have to tell it no every now and then. You can't let the flesh just do whatever it wants to. And that's the problem with these people. They're letting the flesh have its way. Lasciviousness and uncleanness, like I said, they go together. Ephesians 4, verse 19 says, Who being past feeling? I want you to notice that. These people have gone past the regular feeling of normal people, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with what? Greediness. Just what the president's wife used to say, just say no. Good advice. Uh, sometimes it's, it's hard for people to, uh, uh, you know, just be told no. People don't like to be told no. Um... There was a little boy one time that his mother had forbidden him to go swimming. Uh, I, we don't know why. But she would let him go out for a walk. So one day he went out for his walk. And he came back and it was quickly evident from his outer wet britches <laughs> that, he, that he had disobeyed his mother and gone into the water. And... Uh, when his mother asked why, he said, Well, mother, I just happened to have my swimming trunks with me and decided to go for a swim. Well, you see the problem with that, don't you? That kid planned on going swimming long before he left the house. I mean, you get the, you get the idea of the story. Then there's idolatry. Now, uh, we think of idolatry, you know, like them Indiana Jones movies where all these little pagans are, you know, bowing down in front of statues and, and, and they're idolaters that do that all over the world. But idolatry is more than that. Sometimes you can worship an idea that isn't of God. Take evolution, for instance. That's one of the biggest idols we got in school, evolution. Um, there's all kinds of people that worship. Idolatry is worshiping anything that's not God. Basically, First Samuel fifteen verse twenty-three. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. There we go. There's the basic sin of idolatry. There you reject the word of God. He hath also rejected thee from being king. This was said to Saul, of course. Colossians. 3, 5, mortify, therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now notice covetousness is not listed amongst the, as, as a thing amongst the work of the flesh, but idolatry is. Any kind of covetousness according to Colossians, is idolatry. So if you want that thing really bad, maybe you shouldn't have it, maybe you can't afford it, maybe maybe you really don't need it, you know, whatever it is, 
but you really, really, really want it, and that's all you think. You know, you've got an idolatry problem. Take care of it. Witchcraft. Now, you say, can Christians get involved in witchcraft? Yeah, unfortunately, some of them can. I've seen them. Look, I've seen Christians play with Ouija boards and, um, you know, uh, them... Uh, chinky Chinese, what are they, they throw down the sticks and they tell the fortune and, uh, you know, uh, they go to fortune tellers. Uh, my mom was a Christian and uh, she told the story about one time that uh, she went to a fortune teller and when I got saved and got a little later on in my Christian life, I asked her one day, I said, Mama, why in the world did you go to a fortune teller? She said, well, I knew better, but um, I had a friend that convinced me it would be sort of fun. And I looked her straight in her eyes and said, was it fun? She said, no. I said, boy, somebody lied to you, didn't they? She said, yeah. I said, did you ever go back? She said, no. She said, for one thing, I thought it was stupid. It was kind of scary. Uh, there's things involved that you don't want to get involved in. That's one of them. Second Chronicles 30 through 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hemon. Also, he observed times and used enchantments. That's like spells, casting of spells and things. And used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. For he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. There you go. You want to make God real mad at you? Get involved in that stuff. Say, God get angry at a Christian? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every Christian that I've ever seen got off mixed up with that uh, has ended up with a mess in their life. Are they very sick or something? I've seen a few of them through the years. It doesn't end. It doesn't end well. Children, stay away from that stuff. I care how fun they want to tell you it is. It's not. Hatred, hatred. Ah, uh, there's a lot of people get involved in hatred. Now, I, I, I'm I'm not talking about I hate broccoli. No, <laughs> real hatred is something much worse than that. Okay. Um, if you got hungry enough, you'd eat broccoli. Believe me. Um, so you don't really hate it. Uh, hatred, uh, Psalm 25, Consider mine enemies, for they are many, for they hate me with cruel hatred. Now, there, there's a good term, cruel hatred. If you hate somebody, you want to see them go into something bad or something bad happened to them um or you wish you wish them ill uh, Christians are supposed to be above hatred now you can hate sin you can hate the devil if you want to you can hate the devil's angels but each other and other people no you're not supposed to do that you say, well, can you hate something somebody does? Yeah, sure you can. That's like hating sin, whether it's your sin or somebody else's sin. But just because someone does something that you hate, uh, try not to hate that person. Uh, sometimes people get so involved in sin, they just don't know what they're doing. Of course, God still holds them accountable, and you need to pray for that person. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirreth up strifes. There you go. That's a good def under definition of hatred. It, 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 people that hate each other want to fight with one another. But love covereth all sins. <laughs> I like that. Variance. You say, what in the world is variance? Well, we have another term in modern uh, language. It's called wishy-washy. Wishy-washy. That you can't make up your mind what you want. One day you're over here, one day you're over there. One day you're Democrat, next day you're Republican. One day you're this, next day you're that. One day you're Presbyterian, next day you're about, you know, make up your mind what you want to do and do it. Stick with it. Matthew 10, Lord Jesus Christ. 
He said, I am come to set a man's at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Now, this is not a, a, a uh, mission statement on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, look, the stuff that I preach is going to cause people to take sides. You cannot be neutral when it comes to the Bible. You either believe what it says or you don't. You either obey what it says or you don't. You either try to practice it or you don't. There, God doesn't have a middle fairyland ground where things is... No. Uh-uh. Stick with it. And I know people that can't make up their mind. One day they're a Christian, the next day they're not. One day they, you know, this and the next day, you know, make up your mind what you're going to do. Emulations. Now, that's an interesting word. Um, Romans eleven fourteen. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are my flesh and might save some of them. Emulations. Um... We have another word, imitations. When you emulate someone, you want to be like them. So I ask you, who are your heroes? You got any heroes? You should have some heroes. I've got some heroes. J. Frank Norris is one of my heroes. Dr. Peter S. Rockman is one of my heroes. Uh, William J. Smith is one of my heroes. Uh, Brother McGahee is one of my heroes. Uh, Brother Shiver was one of my heroes. Um, Brother Woodward was one of my heroes. Uh, Brother Mays. Uh, I mean, I could just name them. Preacher people. And then I have people that are heroes of mine that aren't preachers. I happen to think of a lot of a general named Patton. Now, there was a lot of things wrong with General George Patton. But you know what? George Patton... He knew what he believed and he and, and he he was when you sent him into battle you knew he would get the job done. Yes, would. That's what I like about him. And it didn't matter to him how he got the job done. Uh, and people didn't like it sometimes. They would criticize him for it. Uh, one time he went into a, 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 a medical tent and there was a guy lying there and uh, he thought he was a malinger. And he picked him up and he slapped him. Because he didn't think he should be there. Well, he got in all kinds of trouble for that. You know, the General Patton slaps a sick soldier. Well, it's debatable whether the soldier was really sick or not. They claimed he had what they called back then battle fatigue. And maybe he did. But all George saw was a guy... Um, that in his estimation was faking it. Well, I would have been disappointed had Patton done anything else. If Patton believed in something, he did something about it. I wish more Christians were like that, don't you? Emulations. Emulations. Uh, of course, there's wrath. You say, what's the difference between anger and wrath? Well... The Bible says, be angry and sin not. You can be angry and not be sinful. You have to work at it, but you can do that. But when you get to the point where you start committing wrath, you take that anger and you do something bad, that's what wrath is. To someone else or to yourself or you know whatever it is, that's sinful. And the Bible says we shouldn't partake in wrath. Uh, First Corinthians, uh, First Thessalonians, rather. I'm, I'm reading the wrong verse on my sheet here. First Thessalonians five nine. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, when God saved you, He saved you from God's eternal wrath, and He also saved you from your wrath. Something you ought to put down in your life. You ought to just try to get rid of strife. That means argumentative. You you like to argue with people. I've known people like that. For uh, 1 Corinthians 3.3 3, For ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. 
Are ye not carnal and walk as men? Look, when, when you're walking according to the flesh, there's a lot of this fighting and feuding and fussing. You ever met a family of people that all they did was fuss about everything? I mean, they sit down in a restaurant and they fuss about who's got the, uh, you know, the best fork or spoon or, or, or no, that's, uh, no, and they just, and, and, and it's hard to sit next to a person like that in a restaurant. You want to go say, can you move my table, you know, to the back alley or somewhere? I don't want to sit by them. Uh, fuss, 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 fuss. Quit fussing. Seditions. Now that, that is something. That's when you plot to overthrow something else. And you sneak around to do it. They have these things called conspiracy theories. Well, sometimes it's a real thing. <laughs> if it's a real thing, it's not a theory. It's a conspiracy. And people that indulge in science, they have seditions. Uh, Ezra 4.19 And I commanded, and a search was made. This was the king of Persia. And it was found that this city of old time had made insurrection against kings... And that rebellion and sedition had been made therein. So the guy went back and checked on the records under Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. He found, yeah, Jerusalem, they rebelled against their conqueror, Nebuchadnezzar and such. And that's why he took them and took them on to, uh, to, to captive. Um, we live in a good system. You, you really have to find something bad wrong to, to be a seditionist in America. I mean... You know, really? What are you going to be, rebel against? The fact that you got plenty to eat? Or you can pay your bills? Or you own two or three cars? I mean, really? Uh, people that rebel against the government, you, usually, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're dressed in rags and they're starving to death and they don't know where their next mouthful for their children is going to come from. That's the kind of people that rebel against things. Americans have no really uh, right to rebel against the system we have. You say, what about when we started? Well, we had legitimate complaints. We were Englishmen, and we were supposed to have the rights of Englishmen, and we found out we really didn't. So we said, hey, what, what gives here? We're Englishmen. Shouldn't we have the same rights as the other Englishmen? And you know what England said? They said, no. We said, well, okay, well, we'll fix that. So we did. Heresies. Oh, there's all kinds of heresies. Heresies is teaching anything that's not true. 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2. And there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. You see that? False teachers come along in the, in the church. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom... The way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Look, heresies is a bad thing no matter how you slice it. It's teachings that put a bad light on what the Bible truly says or what Christianity is supposed to be. Heresies can be the way you act or something you teach and preach. Stay away from that stuff. Envying. Now this is a popular sin. There's lots of envying going on in this planet. Acts 7, 9. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Now all you have to do is go back to the book of Genesis to study these, uh, these brethren against their brother Joseph. Joseph was daddy's little boy and daddy loved him and, you know, he, they, he petted on him. He gave him the coat of many, you know, and, and so, you know, they were jealous. They were, they, they wanted to be like him. They wanted daddy to pet on them like they did him. So they, they were envying of him. James uh, 4, do you think that the scriptures in vain, saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy Envying comes from the lust of, of, of our souls. Um, somebody once said this about our rights. It says, we claim things as our right sometimes to which we have no right at all. 
In fact, we have no right to anything, and sometimes God impresses us uh, uh, this upon us by taking things from us. Let us not be like the sick man to whom a benevolent gentleman had been giving a quart of milk a day. At last the time came for this poor man to die, and of course the gift of milk was expected to come to an end when the man died. So here's this old sick man, this guy sending a quart of milk every day to this poor old sick guy trying to keep him alive, give him something to eat. When he was gone, the gentleman called upon his widow. And she said, I must tell you, sir, that my husband had made a will and he left the quart of milk to his brother. Now think about that. That quart of milk really didn't belong to him. It was a gift from someone else. But he, he, he had gotten it for so long he expected it. Uh, everything we get from God is a gift, folks. Amen? Envy. Murders. Hopefully we got no murderers around here. Psalm 10, verse 8 and 9. He that sitteth in the lurking places. Oh, I, I like that term. The lurking places. Of the villages. Uh, in the sea. I, in, in my mind's eye, I see this little village. And I have, you know, ye old apothecary. Ye old general store. And then there's this sign down the corner. Lurking places. <laughs> down some alley somewhere. No, there's no sign at lurking places. Um, in the villages, in the secret places, doth the murder the innocent, doth he murder the innocent, his eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. That's how you know they're talking about murder here. Because a lion comes out and kills, kills little critters. He lieth to wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him uh, into his net. So, murder is something of the flesh. Drunkenness. And yes, Christians can get involved in murder. If you don't believe it, go to Florida State Prison, go to death row, and talk to some of them fellers. Ezekiel 23, 33. Drunkenness. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, Thou shalt break the uh, sh shards thereof and pluck off thine own breast, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Drunkenness. You do all kinds of crazy stuff when you get drunk. Mm -hmm. Revelings. 1 Peter 4, 3. So what's a reveling? Well, let's look and see what the Bible says. For in times past of our life may suffice us, to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness. So this has, is connected with lasciviousness. Lusts, excess of wine, revelings. Well, sounds like banquetings and abominable idolatry. Sounds like a big old drunken party, don't it? Christians shouldn't be involved in that stuff. This is all works of the flesh. You see what's wrong with it right here. Now, what we should ought to be doing is we ought to be participating in the fruit of the Spirit. Now notice it's a fruit. It's not fruits, it's fruit. If you've got the Holy Spirit of God and He's worked on you at all, you ought to have these things in your life. Love. Love appears 310 times in the Bible. That's just the word love. Now, I'm not talking about loving or loved or any of the, any of the tenses or forms of love. Just the word love. 310 times. That's a lot. Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Look, you want to find God's love in your life when you're lost and when you're saved. And you ought to have that same love to other people. You say, what if they don't treat me right? Love them anyway. God loved you anyway. 1 John 5, 2. But this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. So there, that's what a Christian should ought to be doing. We ought to love God and love one another. Joy. Now, 
Joy comes in two forms. You have joy the verb and you have joy the noun. Joy the verb, uh, Philippians 2.18, for this same cause also you do joy and rejoice with me. So it's being very happy. The noun, Philippians 4.1, therefore my brother and dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown. So he said, to you guys, that you're such, such favorites of mine. I, 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 I tell people about you, and I wear you around like, like a crown. You, you're, you're, you, 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 what I, you're what I like to brag on. That's pretty good. Joy. Peace. Oh, so many people need peace. Peace comes from God. 1 Peter 3.11, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. And ensue it. In other words, we're supposed to go and we're actively supposed to look after peace and seek for it and, and find it where we can. James 3.18 And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Now the Lord of peace. Notice it says the Lord himself is the Lord of peace. Give you peace. Always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Peace. Peace. Long suffering. Oh there's a tough one. You say well I, ha I struggle with that. I didn't say all these fruits came easy. You know some fruits are a lot more trouble than other fruits. You know apple tree. Uh, you know. It just kind of grows. You might want to go out and spray it for bugs once a year. But the apples grow and then they get big enough and you pick them and eat them. Well, they're real, real simple. But, uh, you know, there's other fruits. you gotta, you got to baby them and tie them up and do this and do that and the other thing. And, and you spend all your time fiddling with it. And then half the time it's something don't work out right. Well, long suffering is like one of them things that you have to fiddle and piddle with. Romans 2.14 or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Notice that God has long suffering, and there's riches in having long suffering. Um, if you live your life for only those things that are quick and easy, um, there are some things that take a while. Um, I've told you the story about the time that I made caramel. My mom and dad used to go off, uh, when my dad got saved and they'd leave me at the house. And I told you this before and I, I, I would cook stuff. And one weekend I decided to make caramel, uh, you know, real honest to goodness caramel, um, from scratch. And, uh. I found I found that one thing, making it's not that easy, and burning it is real easy. And when you burn, now this is back before the days when everything was a Teflon pan. These were my mom's good Echo Wear. Y'all ladies know what Echo Wear is. Good Echo Wear pans. And uh, when they got home, there was a sink full of, half of them had burnt caramel in the bottom. Uh, she made me stand at that sink for what seemed like hours scrubbing them. I got all the caramel out of them pans eventually. I still have one or two of them pans, by the way, that I inherited from my mother. So I know I got them clean. But uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It really wasn't. Um, so, but when I finally got the recipe right and I made that caramel and I put it in that pan and that's one thing that kind of got me a little bit out of trouble as I opened the refrigerator and handed my mother the pan of caramel I had made and she ate a couple pieces and said, well, that's pretty good. I still don't like all the dirty pans. <laughs> it tastes pretty good. My mother's weakness was candy. 
<laughs> so I knew what to do. Here's some candy that I made. Long suffering. Gentleness. Don't be heavy handed. Gentle. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you. Romans uh, 2 4. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians, uh, yeah, 1 Thessalonians 2 7. Uh, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherith her children. Look, you don't, you know, you don't throw kids around when they're little babies. You, you treat them real gentle. Cause, and that's the way God treats us. And that's the way we ought to treat other people. Be gentle with them. They'll throw them around. James 3.17 But wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Goodness. Gentleness. Psalm 107, 21, goodness. So what is goodness? Well, it's the opposite of badness. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful work to the children of man. Uh, if you want a good example of how, what, how goodness is and what it is and what, what it should be, look to God. He's good to people. He's good to people. Say, what about those people over in Hawaii that lost their homes? Look. Most of those people got out of there. You say, what about all their stuff? It's just stuff. Most people have lots of insurance nowadays. You know what happens when they lose their stuff? Insurance company makes sure they get more stuff. But a lot of people have their lives. And they sat, they sat there outside of their town, you know, miles away from where it was going on, the fires and stuff. And, 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 and I'm sure they said, well, thank God we're alive. Thank God our children are alive. And they were very, very thankful to be not in that other place. Goodness. Goodness. Psalm 21, 3. For thou preventest him with the blessing of goodness. And thou settest a crown of pure gold on his head. Goodness is a blessing. Faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith comes from God, beloved. And God's book. Meekness. First, Thessal First Corinthians rather. 421. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod or, or in love? Or in the spirit of meekness? So he's rebuking the Corinthians. He says look. Would you rather have me come with a stick? <laughs> or, or, or do you want me to come and speak nice to you? I know what most people would rather. Temperance. Now, there's something word we don't use much anymore. There was a thing called the temperance movement. That, uh, people swore off of drinking, amen? Uh, but temperance has to do with all kinds of other things you want to swear off of. Uh, Acts 24, 25, this is Paul preaching. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. I will have a convenient season. I will call for thee. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. When you preach about temperance to non-Christian people, they get upset. Because most lost people don't have any kind of a temperance usually. Or if they do, it's very little. There's a little fable about a piece of wood that complained. A little piece of wood that complained. And he complained bitterly because his owner kept whittling things away from him. I mean, he's a piece of wood, what does he expect? Um, and he kept cutting at it and whittling away at it and filing at it. And Then one day he started putting holes in it. And the wood said, boy, this, this is something. My guy keeps whittling on me and filing on me. and Now he's putting holes in me. Well... He didn't realize that his owner was making something wonderful out of him. He was a piece of ebony wood. And he figured, well, I'm ebony wood. You should treat me better. I'm, I'm a rare wood. So what was the guy doing? He was making a flute. And when he was done, he picked up the flute and played the most beautiful music. And the little, the little piece of wood says, oh, I sound good now, don't I? I sound pretty good. Well, you know what? That's what God does with us. He takes and he, he, he 
he whittles some off of us and he, he sands on us and he, he may put a few holes in us. And he makes something beautiful out of us. Say, well, what about all the other things in our life? Well, notice in verse 24 we read that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So that's how you get rid of all that other stuff that you don't want. You crucify it. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's how we get the other stuff done. Colossians 2.14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, con which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus helps us all the way with our life. We just have to trust in him. We have to say, God, bring out those good things. I bet you didn't know there was a tree called the healing tree. Uh, you may know it by another name. It's called the eucalyptus tree. And for a long time, people referred to it as the healing tree. Um, it has been stated by scientists that the eucalyptus tree is destined to save the world from a famine of wood. Its growing powers are marvelous. A certain large plantation on the Pacific coastline set out some 25 years ago and has cut down the trees three times in 25 years. It is again high into the air and again it's ready to be harvested. It is most serviceable. It produces cordwood and piling. Uh, it makes excellent fuel. It uh, protects orange and lemon groves along the coast from the ocean winds. Above all, it has medicinal value for the oil extract is remarkable. In California, it is a home cure from almost every ailment from the simple cold to consumption. A wonderful tree full of promise for mankind. There is another tree, however, destined to save the world in a higher and truer sense. It was the tree of shame on the hill of Calvary. There somebody hung on that tree and it proved to be the salvation of millions of souls. Now we need to go out and tell the story of that tree. And, and eating of the fruits of that tree provides good things in the paradise of God where it saves people too. And the Bible says its leaves are for the healing of the nations. We live in a sin-sick world, folks. Uh... It's sick of adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, and revelings. And it needs to be saved to the love of, and power of Jesus. For the love, joy, peace, etc., etc., that we have in the Spirit. Amen. Next week, we get to start chapter 6. And we'll be winding all old Galatians down. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the book of Galatians. God was one of the first books I tried to memorize as a young uh, kid. And Lord, it's been a blessing to me. I can't say it anymore like I used to. But God, it's there in the back of my mind. And God, all this stuff stays there. And God, you use it and, and, and help me with things from it. And I pray you help us as we go our way. Help us to dedicate our lives to the things of the Spirit. And not the things of the flesh. Because God, the flesh dies. And it withers. And it goes away. But the eternal spirit of the eternal God, well, that's going to be forever. Thank you for that, Lord. Help us to spread the news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.